Good morning. It's good to be together again this morning. I'm sure you've been receiving many blessings during this past uh, couple of days. <coughs> they have prepared so many very excellent things for us here. This morning we're going to be dealing with, uh, continuing to deal with issues of justification, but we're going to go back in history today so we can understand what's happening now. We're going to go back to the time of Martin Luther and uh, Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon. And of these two, Ellen White has this to say. By the way, we did have our prayer, didn't we? Oh, I greeted you and I think we went right ahead. I always like to start with prayer, so to bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for bringing us here and for giving us light and understanding. And we pray for your Holy Spirit's presence in the name of Jesus. Amen. Of the Luther-Melanchthon relation, Ellen White says that when Luther so much needed the sympathy and counsel of a true friend, God's providence sent Melanchthon to Wittenberg. Young in years, modest and diffident in his manners, Melanchthon's sound judgment, extensive knowledge, and winning eloquence combined with the purity and uprightness of his character, he soon became Luther's most trusted friend and valued supporter. His gentle caution and exactness serving as a complement to Luther's courage and energy. Their union in the work added strength to the Reformation and was a great uh, encouragement to Luther. I would just like to say that, uh, that Melanchthon was the one who helped Luther to move more and more away from the papal, papacy to biblical Christianity. Luther, uh, Melanchthon was the one that Luther pointed to as being the best or, or the greatest theologian. And uh, Luther did appreciate Melanchthon, and Melanchthon appreciated Luther. And they worked very well together. However, Luther had a problem which he never fully escaped, and that was mysticism. Whereas the Roman Catholic Church uh, taught uh, that the emblems of the Lord's Supper uh, were actually the body and the literal presence of Christ, Luther recognized that as false and rejected it, but introduced a concept that was very near the same. And Luther, um, uh, Luther's position was consubstantiation rather than transubstantiation. Trans meanings move across, con is move with. So the concept of papal concept of transubstantiation is that it changes from bread and wine to the literal body and blood of Christ. So that the teaching of the papacy was that when they drank the wine, they were actually drinking Christ's literal blood. And when they ate the wafer of the bread, they would be eating his literal body. And Luther, instead of teaching that it was changed, he, just, he says it was not changed, but he believed in consubstantiation, which meant that with the wine was Christ's blood. With the bread was also Christ's body. And uh, it was a very important principle with Luther and his followers were very uh, devout in, in focusing on the consubstantiation principle. Melanchthon saw in the Lord's Supper that it was symbolic. 
and that it was not literal flesh and literal blood, either transubstantiation or consubstantiation. I might mention first, however, that Luther had a great deal of uh, uh, an intense conflict with Zwingli. Why? Because Zwingli claimed that it was not the body and not the blood of Christ, but a symbol of Christ's body and blood. Now, we would agree with Zwingli, but Luther refused to accept and to acknowledge Lu uh, Zwingli as a fellow Christian. And uh, the followers of Luther and the followers of Zwingli were eager for these two men to come together so that the unity of the body could be established. Luther refused for some time to meet with Zwingli and finally, as a result of continued uh, pressing by his followers, uh, Luther agreed to meet with Zwingli. However, in their discussion, no matter what evidence Zwingli brought forth regarding this being a symbol rather than the reality, Luther, the, Luther's only response is that, that it is my body. Jesus said, this is my blood. This is my body. And uh, therefore, it must be the literal body that we actually chew the body of Christ with our teeth. And this is the way Luther put it, that we chew him with our teeth. Uh, Melanchthon recognized that this Lord's Supper was symbolic. But in honor of Luther, he quietly countered his mysticism with, uh, countered Luther's mysticism without uh, confronting him. In other words, he didn't say this is not the body of Christ. He simply treated the symbols as symbols. And Luther appreciated this uh, 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 manner of approach. And although he refused at the end of that discussion with Zwingli, he refused to shake hands with him. Uh, acknowledged that he was even Christian, but uh, he was willing to accept Philip Melanchthon's approach to it, although it was not something that he actually accepted himself. Now, <clears throat> Luther died the year that the uh, Council of Trent started. Uh, what was the Council of Trent? The Council of Trent was the council that went on for years uh, and the papacy, which was intended to be a reform. The Protestant world, uh, the Protestant movement had existed because almost everyone felt that there needed to be reform in the church. And so now the Council of Trent meets, and the purpose of the Council of Trent was very specific, and that was to counter the Protestant Reformation. It is called the Counter Reformation. Now, in, in, in countering, countering the Reformation, the purpose was to play one group of Protestants off against the other. And so what the Council of Trent did was condemn the extremes of Protestantism on this side, Protestantism on that side. Interestingly enough, all of these things they were countering were really Roman Catholic doctrines. Roman Catholicism had within itself two opposite branches. And uh, by indicting the extremes of both branches, identified those extremes with Protestantism. And unfortunately, Protestantism did have the two extremes, and therefore this was very effective. Because we have 
Calvin on the one hand, and the Arminian later, Arminius was a little later, but you had your, your Arminian, those who emphasized the will in the plan of salvation on the other. And there were extremes, both within papacy and within Protestantism, and what the Council of Trent did was to split the Protestant Reformation by pressing on the extremes, causing each uh, uh, of those extremes within Protestantism to protest the other one rather than to dealing with the, the, with the papacy itself. Now, when Luther was still alive, his followers took extreme positions on the side of those who rejected the will, which really was the same direction that Calvin uh, went. And uh, Philip Melanchthon's rule was to emphasize the will, which we will see in just a moment. Luther had honored Melanchthon's respectful symbolic view of the emblems and came to agree with his synergistic justification. That may be a word that you're not acquainted with, synergistic, but it means the union of the objective work of Christ and the subjective response of the human heart. Now, this synergy was claimed by, uh, in other words, those who resisted Melanchthon claimed that his theology was synergistic, which they claimed was heretical. In other words, their, their view was based on extreme Calvinistic concepts in which the will of man was claimed, but disclaimed at the same time. In other words, they insisted that it was a will, but that actually God determined. It's called, called deterministic theology, that God determines the decision of man before he's born. And basically, what it does is to leave the individual with great uncertainty. Was he chosen or was he not? Was he amongst the elect? If he was in the, amongst the elect, he cannot be lost. However, if he's not among the elect, he cannot be saved. And this is a very, was a very strong position. But Melanchthon's position was synergistic. They call it synergistic because it brings together the law and grace. God's grace, man's response to that grace in obedience so that it brings together God's law and the grace of God. Now, this was the contribution of Melanchthon. And during the lifetime of Luther, he came more and more to accept this synergistic position. But his followers were opposed to it. In fact, they were doing all they could to oppose Melanchthon. However, Luther was a close friend of Melanchthon's and considered him to be the greatest theologian. So he was very protective of Melanchthon. And while Luther lived, Melanchthon had a key role in the Lutheran Reformation. However, as soon as Luther died, his opponents pounced on him immediately and were greatly, uh, they were greatly uh, aided by the Roman Catholic Council of Trent, which uh, did everything they could to divide, which they did very effectively. And uh, as a result of this counter-reformation, the Roman Catholic Church gained back a great deal of what it had lost. But the reason was because of division within Protestantism. And we need to remember that while we stand for truth, and that is ultimately important, 
we must also seek unity. And if we do not seek unity with as much uh, zeal as we seek truth, we are going to be in trouble. And if we do not seek truth with as much zeal as we seek unity, either way, we are, uh, we do need to seek both unity and truth. And the fact is that when Luther died, Luther's following uh, followers uh, zeroed in on Melanchthon and did what they could to actually divorce him from the Protestant movement entirely. And by the way, I've mentioned here the synergistic justification, which means that justification is not strictly legal, it involves human response. And I would like to say at this point that the issue really needed to have been discussed in, turn of, in terms of atonement. Christ did make the atonement at the cross. Luther's extreme followers insisted that uh, on universal justification at the cross. The fact is, it was universal atonement. When Christ died, his death covered all sin of all men, any time, all time. But that was not justification. Justification involves human response to God's atonement. And as soon as we respond to that atonement, it's ours. It's ours in the nature of justification. So as soon as we accept it, it becomes our justification. And Nisio, by the way, uh, I put Nisio as a point uh, opposed Melanchthon. The word Nisio means genuine. And so those who uh, followed Luther and opposed Melanchthon called themselves Nisios. In other words, they were the genuine Lutherans. And in fact, this is interesting because although the Protestant world continues to uh, accept the idea of, of a sola scriptura, in reality they treat Luther with greater deference, deference than new scripture, scripture. And uh, the fact is that we are accused of having a prophet who we follow, Ellen White, in reality, it is the Lutherans and those who have come out of them, and I'll be talking about that again. Uh, we've already mentioned that uh, the um, brethren, Plymouth brethren, have adopted the ultimate, least, uh, that is the Nisio Lutheran approach, and this is the ones that perpetuate it today, uh, and they, their influences penetrated every church group, every uh, Christian group, so that even now Adventism. The Luther's followers rejected Luther's growing light under the influence of Melanchthon. Luther more and more lost confidence in this strictly legal justification and came more and more to recognize the importance of what they called synergy, the response of human, their human response to divine uh, activity. As a result of resisting Luther's growing light, they rejected the idea of sleep and death, which Luther accepted, denied immortality of the soul, and came to believe in the uh, sleep of death. But his followers rejected this, and today many of Lutherans have no idea that Luther ever taught that, which he held, by the way, until his death. There were other points of light, including 
the fact that Luther came more and more to recognize the importance of the human will. Now justification, as I mentioned before, was provided at the cross. And I think the best way to address that is through the word atonement. Christ did make the atonement at the cross. And when we deny uh, justification at the cross, that means everyone being justified at 31 AD, long before we're born. What we can do is to recognize that Christ's death made the atonement for all men of all times who believe in Christ and receive the atonement. They are justified, but they are only justified when they believe and when they receive. And then at that point, they are, according to Paul's language, they are in Christ Jesus. In other words, they are justified because they receive Christ's righteousness. And it's Christ's righteousness that justifies. And it's only Christ's righteousness that carries us through the judgment. And those that are in Christ Jesus have no worry about the judgment because Christ is there and his record will be received in lieu of our own, no matter what it is. And it doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian or how deeply in sin we went. If we're in Christ Jesus, the Father will judge us according to Christ's own righteousness, his character. And this is why we need the righteousness of Christ. It's the only uh, currency that the kingdom of heaven will accept. Uh, the German historian Wilhelm Weiler declared, uh, speaking of Melanchthon and describing his uh, position, since 1527, Melanchthon had abandoned the deterministic bent of the Reformation. That means the bent of believing that God has predestined everyone to a particular destiny and they are unable to change that. But Melanchthon moved away from the deterministic uh, concept and uh, supported the idea of synergism, which should keep the causality of sin aloof from God and assert man's responsibility. So in other words, synergism as Melanchthon was dealing with it, was considered to be heretical. But what was heretical? Well, it was the belief that man chooses his own destiny by choosing whether to accept Christ or not to accept him. And that was considered to be heretical because it violated the deterministic principles that God foreordains before we're ever born the destiny of all men. Now, if my will is essential to become a part of Christ's kingdom, then it denies the deterministic principle. And this is what Melanchthon had to get over, and it's something that Luther more and more came to accept. The deterministic bent of the Reformation, and it supported the idea of synergism, and what does that do? Well, without synergism, God becomes responsible for sin. Adam sinned originally, but then God, according to the deterministic doctrine of original sin, it means that God has transferred the guilt of Adam to all his children. And uh, the fact is that all his children do receive guilt, but we'll discuss tomorrow how that guilt is received. It is an important principle to understand, 
but the fact is that we must understand that God is not the author of sin. He's not the facilitator of sin. He is not, it is not God's desire to create guilt. Guilt is a result of violation of the principles of God's love, which are the principles of his government. And uh, so it was that, that uh, Melanchthon was able to move away from that and then it says, man's salvation can only be accomplished with the aid of cooperative decision of his own will, without any mention of merit. This question of merit is so important because those who teach this uh, doctrine identify a, a, a sanctification with man's will. That's correct. That's all right but they identify that as meritorious. And this means that they claim that if you believe that there must be a union of the divine and human in salvation, that you're teaching legalism. This is what the, the charge is, that you're teaching legalism. And the fact is that it is not true. Before man sinned, God and man were united. When sin is finally over, God and man will be in union again. And the issue of when we're united has to do with justification. It is through justification, the receiving of the atonement, that we become a part of Christ's kingdom. And that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when we're born the first time, we're born biologically. But we cannot enter into the kingdom. Earthly things cannot enter the kingdom. Only that which is of the spirit. And when we are born again, we are received into the kingdom of Christ and are considered to be his children, children of the kingdom. And it is an act of man's will that determines that. It is not God who determines it. Those who claim that uh, our destiny is already determined are actually placing the responsibility for sin upon God himself. But the responsibility of sin, according to Melanchthon, is that of man. Man is responsible for sin. I will be discussing that tomorrow in a different way. The warfare against self, Ellen White says, is the greatest battle that was ever fought. And it is the will of man that determines whether that battle, battle is fought to a conclusion or not. Our responsibility is to continue to choose Christ, but it's a battle. Every day we're confronted with uh, uh, different agencies of the enemy to disconnect us from God and that we would not continue to, to exercise our will. As I mentioned before, the Nicio Lutherans deny the active will. And they call the active function of the will synergistic. This is we, we've, as we've discussed. They falsely accuse Melanchthon of Pelagian legalism, which means uh, that we are saved by faith plus works. Actually, we are saved by a faith that works. And it works through the power of the divine power not through the human power. Therefore, there are things about the, uh, the deterministic view that may be true in themselves. For instance, uh, it is true that we cannot save ourselves and no matter what good things we do, we're not saved because of our goodness. We're saved because of his goodness. And there is no time of which we, until Christ comes and changes this mortal body and it becomes immortal, 
this corruptible becomes incorruptible. Not until then will we actually be restored in such a way that we become good. And that, of course, is the work of God. It's a work of, uh, of, uh, of transformation, physiological. In other words, when Christ comes, our whole natures will be changed. We will again have the nature of Adam before he sinned. The nature of Adam before he sinned was simply a nature tuned to the principle of love, so completely tuned to it that uh, he was instinctive that he would follow that. Now, you and I are going to have to battle with the flesh until Christ changes our vile body so that it becomes like his glorious body, according to Philippians 3.21. But in the meantime, he is our righteousness. So we don't have to be afraid. We can have complete confidence because I'm not saved by my own righteousness. I'm saved in spite of my corruption and I'm saved by his righteousness. And it's his righteousness that will carry me through the judgment or I won't make it. That's the only way. And so we have today, I've been talking about Nisio uh, Lutherans, and I would like to say now that that is talking about Plymouth Brethren theology, the theology that Desmond Ford has accepted has not Luther's position, as he continually claims, frequently say, speaks of being Luther theology. That is not Luther's theology. That was his extreme followers who imposed that extreme view and opposed the synergistic principles of Melanchthon, which are essential for us to maintain an understanding of the relationship of God to sin. It's a theodicy issue and extremely important for us to understand that it is our own choices that will determine our destiny. God does not determine our de destiny. We determine it as we respond to his gift. And what has he given us? He's given us both uh, a, a payment on our, a, a full and total payment on our, all of our uncleanness and sin. But he also is uh, offered us his own righteousness so that we, in connection with him, and by the way, this is the important principle of Minneapolis, is a union between the law and grace a union between the divine and the human. And, of course, grace is the divine and obedience is human. But these combine in such a way that even the human action becomes a response to God's own actions so that he empowers whatever we choose when we choose to, to accept his gift of salvation. At this period of time, Whaler, the historian we just referred to, says a good Lutheran watchword at that time was rather Catholic than Calvinist. It throws a lurid light on the mutual hostility that divided the ranks of evangelicals. Now, brothers and sisters, no matter how different views we may have from others within our church, we must remember that God is not God is a God of truth, but not of hostility. And uh, there will be conflict between truth and error. And this involves hostility, but the hostility is not to be between people, but it's between the powers of righteousness and the powers of evil. And when we become involved in conflict with one another, as a result of our different convictions. We actually are joining the side of Satan, whose whole purpose is to divide and plunder. And he used this very effectively 
uh, through the Counter-Reformation by pitting one part of Protestantism against the other. And it was this that gave birth to eventually to the, uh, to the uh, Plymouth Brethren movement, and we'll see how that happened in just a moment. The conflict between the Philippus, which are Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon was called, followers are called Philippus, between the Philippus and uh, the Nicio Lutherans was so intense that finally the German princes demanded that they come together and settle their disagreements and that they find some point, some way of finding unity. And it was uh, Flaxius uh, Matthias who uh, was the head of the extreme Lutheran uh, faction was so extreme that they finally formed a middle party. And with that middle party, uh, in the effort to find unity, uh, Nicholas Stalnecker, uh, Stalnecker and Martin Chemnitz joined in with the middle party to try to find a way of solving their enmity. By the way, disagreement does not require enmity. When we have enmity, we all automatically have taken Satan's side, no matter how true our position may be. Satan is the one who is the, uh, the, the prince of disunity. But God is the God of truth. And we can have truth and can have love at the same time, even though we differ in our understandings. But at any rate, after two attempts uh, of unity uh, with the middle party, which failed, Selnecker and Chemnitz joined with the middle party to seek a resolution. And it was very interesting because these were Philip Melanchthon's disciples. And what they came up with eventually in 1577, uh, the Articles of Concord in 1577, and then by 1580, a Book of Concord in which the articles were developed and so forth. And this Book of Concord is what today the um, Plymouth Brethren claim as the basis of truth. They claim this was representative of, Melanch of uh, Luther and Calvin. And the fact is, when they insist on Luther and Calvin, they're insisting on uniting two people that were divided and were never united. In fact, they were so divided on the part of Luther that he refused to shake hands with Calvin. But Paxton, the theologian that I told you about the other day that converted Desford and Brinsmead to the Plymouth Brethren theology, um, insists continually, repeatedly, and so does Ford as well, that the Book of Concord and the Articles of Concord are the basis for truth. In fact, we'll notice here that it's anything could be farther from, nothing could be farther from the truth. Luther and Calvin uh, are then united from a distance by the Plymouth Brethren when they were very disunited in the immediate present so that it does not ring true. And as a result of this Articles of Concord, uh, they, that whole program was to, to deny Calvin. And it was an ultra Lutheran position. And it was the frame, the uh, articles were framed in such a way as to oppose both Luther and Calvin. And they were careful not to 
denounce Luther in this because they're hoping to bring together the disciples of both of them. But this actually resulted in a confused mixture that represented neither Luther nor Calvin. And of this, Philip Schaff says, the Articles of Concord contain not simply opposite truths to be reconciled by theological science, but contradictory assertions which ought never to be put in one creed. It is hyper-Augustinian and hyper-Calvinistic in the doctrine of human depravity and anti-Augustinian in the doctrine of divine predestination. I decided after hearing over and over again the insistence that we must follow the, in other words, we must accept the Articles of Concord as the basis for faith, I decided to look those up and study them and see what they actually said. And I was not really shocked but surprised to find that they do not in any wise represent Plymouth Brethren theology today. Plymouth Brethren theology represents a part, some parts of that, but the actual articles are so contradictory that they directly contradict the Plymouth Brethren position. And they also affirm in other ways. And one of the most important things about that Articles of Concord was their determination to maintain consubsta consubstantiation. And uh, in doing so, they had to give here and they had to give there, and wherever that happened, it places the whole Book of Concord in discord. And that as a reason why many historians have called it the Articles of Discord. I would like to make a few comments as we conclude. Um, all heresy is based on truth. If it didn't have any truth to it, there would be nothing to convince anyone. It's the truth elements in a heresy that make it fly and that cause people to accept it. And there is much truth that, uh, that you can find in any of these heresies. Indeed, Hinduism contains, and Buddhism, any of the other religions, they all contain some truth. And the truth that they contain oftentimes is very vital truth, and oftentimes is truth that other organizations violate. And so it causes a person to be drawn to it. What we need to know is whether or not any given principle is truth. If it's truth, truth is singular. Truth is not in conflict. It may appear to be so because of the paradoxical nature of truth, in which there are two principles that balance each other, and each one essential to the other. Either one without the other becomes her heretical. And whether it's this one or that one makes no difference, the result is the same. It's a violation of truth itself. So that what we are seeking today, first of all, unity must be in love, and unity must accept the authority of God's word. There is no way for us to be united except in the truth, and the truth is presented in Scripture. And when we surrender ourselves fully to truth and to the principles of God's government, which are based upon love, we will find ways to talk to each other without a, a condemnatory uh, spirit. And may God help us to be able to weather the challenges that lie ahead there are many 
different issues that we face today that need uh, calm judgment. They need the spirit of truth. And truth without the spirit of truth ceases to be true. Shall we bow our heads? Father, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I pray that you will that you will take our wills, that you will transform our lives, that you will teach us how to love one another and how to maintain integrity to your word. In the name of Jesus, amen.